Hello. In this video, we are going to derive the formula for the rotational inertia of a solid sphere. So as you can see, we're given a solid sphere with radius capital R and mass capital M. And we'll say that the axis of rotation is the z-axis. Now, in deriving the rotational inertia, we're going to use the following formula. Really, rotational inertia is just the integral of r squared dm, where dm refers to a differential mass of our sphere. So we'll say that this is a differential mass of our sphere, and r refers to the distance from our differential mass to the axis of rotation. So this distance is represented by r. Now first, it's probably going to be nice if we re-express dm using density. If you recall, differential mass is equal to density times differential volume. So let's just substitute dm for density times differential volume. Now, for our purposes, we're going to say that the density is constant. So we have uniform density throughout our solid sphere. Well, since density is a constant, we can pull it to the outside of our integral. Now, since we're dealing with a sphere, it might be nice if we convert our integral into spherical coordinates. And that's the approach we're going to take. So I'm going to symbolize spherical coordinates as rho, phi, and theta. Rho represents the distance from our differential mass to the origin. Phi represents the angle from the positive z-axis to our differential mass. Now, keep in mind, phi can range anywhere between zero radians and pi radians, right? And next, theta represents the angle measured from the positive x-axis counterclockwise to the projection of our differential mass onto the xy plane. So let me demonstrate that. To project our differential mass onto the xy plane means we draw a dashed line from dm down to the xy plane like this. And I'm going to indicate the intersection with the xy plane right there. And I'm just going to draw a line from the origin to that intersection point. Right. And this dashed line we have drawn is actually going to be perpendicular to the xy plane. So this intersection point represents the projection of our differential mass onto the xy plane. And really, theta is this angle. Right. So these are all three spherical coordinates. And now we're going to convert our integral into spherical coordinates. To start, if you recall, differential volume in spherical coordinates is given by rho squared sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. But what is r in spherical coordinates? Well, if we look at the right triangle we have here, we can observe that r is equal to rho sine phi. Now, technically, when using this right triangle, we're limited in saying that phi only ranges between 0 and 90 degrees. But remember, phi can range anywhere between 0 degrees and 180 degrees, or pi radians. And yes, this is in fact true, no matter what phi is between 0 and pi radians. So now, let's replace r with rho sine phi, and dv with rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. Now, in performing these substitutions, we're going to end up with a triple integral because we have three differentials. So this is what we get, but we still have to figure out our bounds of integration. Now remember, this integral refers to d rho, this integral refers to d phi, this integral refers to d theta. Let's first figure out the bounds of integration for this integral. Now remember, our solid sphere ranges from a radius of zero to a radius of capital R. So we're integrating from zero to capital R. What about our integral with respect to phi? Well, we're integrating from an angle of zero from the positive z-axis to an angle of pi radians from the positive z-axis. And lastly, for our integral with respect to theta, well, 
we're integrating from an angle of zero degrees from the positive x-axis, and we move counterclockwise in a full circles through a full two pi radians. So we're integrating from zero to two pi. Right, these bounds of integration will cover our entire sphere. So this is really what we want to evaluate. So let's begin. Well, to start out, let's simplify what we have here. If we simplify this, we're gonna get rho to the power of four times sine cubed phi. Now, let's first evaluate this integral, and I'll call this integral number one. Now, in evaluating this integral, we're integrating with respect to rho. So, phi is treated as a constant. So, we see that we're integrating rho to the power of four, so using the reverse power rule, that's just gonna be one-fifth rho to the fifth. So, integrating this, we get one-fifth rho to the fifth sine cubed phi. Right, and our bounds go from zero to r, so I'm going to write rho equals zero to rho equals r, just to be clear on what variable we're referring to. Now, from here, we're really just taking this, substituting rho for r, subtracting it by this, where we substitute rho for zero. And if we do that, we get one-fifth r to the fifth sine cubed phi minus one-fifth times zero to the fifth sine cubed phi. Well, that just leaves us with one-fifth r to the fifth sine cubed phi. So this is the answer to integral number one. So let's just replace what we have here with one-fifth r to the fifth sine cubed phi. Okay, and we've ran out of room, so let's just move back up to the top. Now from here, since one-fifth r to the fifth is a constant, let's just pull this to the outside So at this point, we want to evaluate this integral, and I'll call this integral number two. Now this is a pretty classic integral to evaluate, and to do it, well, we can re-express sine cubed phi as one minus cosine squared phi sine phi, right? Because one minus cosine squared is just sine squared, so we really just have sine squared times sine, that's equal to sine cubed. And at this point, we can use u substitution. We'll take u to be cosine phi. And if we do that, du will be negative sine phi d phi. And I'll just move the negative sign to the other side of the equation. So what we see here is we can substitute cosine of phi with u, and we can substitute sine phi d phi with negative du. I'll just move the negative sign to the outside of the integral. But that still leaves us with the question of what do our bounds of integration become? Well, we can figure out our bounds of integration using the relationship between u and phi. Because at phi equals zero, we have that u is equal to cosine of zero, which is just one. While at phi equals pi, u is equal to cosine of pi, which is negative one. So this is the new integral we're evaluating. And the integral of 1 minus u squared is just u minus 1 third u cubed. Right, and our bounds go from 1 to negative 1. So all this is going to be is precisely this, where we substitute u for negative 1, minus this, where we substitute u for 1. Now, if you simplify this ridiculous expression, you're going to get 4 thirds. So that would be the answer to this integral. So let's just take what we have here and substitute it for 4 thirds. So now all we gotta do is evaluate this integral. Well, we know that the integral of 4 thirds d theta is just 4 thirds theta. And our bounds go from zero to two pi. And we know that this is just gonna be 4 thirds times two pi minus 4 thirds times zero. Well, that just gives us 4 thirds times two pi. Now, this just simplifies down to, let's see, we have four times two gives us eight, 
and we know that 5 times 3 is 15. So, so we have 8 fifteenths pi r to the fifth d. So now let me just move over here. And let's re-express density as what it is, right? Density is mass over volume, right? Mass over volume, and the volume of our sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So now we see that the pi's are going to cancel out. r to the fifth divided by r cubed leaves us with r squared. So now what we see here is that we have 8 fifteenths r squared m divided by 4 thirds, in other words, times 3 quarters. But then we see that 8 divided by 4 gives us 2 in the numerator, 3 divided by 15 gives us a 5 in the denominator, and then we just have times mr squared. So the rotational inertia of a sphere is 2 fifths mr squared. And so yeah, we have derived the rotational inertia of a solid sphere. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.